Dan Martell, thanks for coming. Brandon, my pleasure, man. This is this is gonna be fun. I um I'm committed to making this one of the best podcast conversations you've had, dude. And I know you've I had a, the the best. I've had some good combos, but it's because we're gonna plug in. All right, and it's I just you this. and I. I love it. And I'm an open book, so oh, pun perfect, intended. Man. Open book. <laughs> Let's get into uh, your story a little bit. So I know you as the author of, obviously, Buy Back Your Time, which we're going to talk about later. I know you're a tech entrepreneur. I know you run a SaaS, uh, what do we call that, a SaaS uh, so it's training? a SaaS, like, yeah, training Group? company. Yeah, it's one of the largest in the world called yeah. SaaS Academy. Okay, so I know, I, like, legit in a YouTube YouTuber. We're going to call you a YouTuber I now. I will accept that title. Because you just passed 100,000 subs. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Eight years uh, in the making. Yeah, and I, I've actually followed you forever, and I don't know what, like, long, long time ago, I followed you from something, and I just you've always just popped up on my feed now for years. So uh, you're doing something right. Thank but you. But before all that, that's who Dan Martell is today. Who was Dan Martell? Start anywhere you want. Man, I was... Hyperactive, okay. uh, crazy, so a lot of energy. I got diagnosed with ADHD when I was 11. Mm. Um, good hearted, but always got in trouble. Like, I mean, it was kind of funny. When, my dad always joked, you know, like your brothers would do stuff, but you would always do stuff and get caught, <laughs> right? Like it was just this running joke. But I mean, I uh, unfortunately grew up in a family where my mom was an alcoholic. Mm. And so there's a lot of, you know, issues at home, I'll say. and. You know, I grew up in a colorful environment, man, where I uh, had way too much time doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. And I got introduced to drugs when I was 13. And just like everything I've done in my life, I go I'm kind of an all in guy. Mm. That's why I don't play golf, because like <laughs> I don't want to lose my Dude, marriage. The same thing. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up um, hanging out with people like kind of, you know, Hell's Angels types doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing and ended up in prison twice by the time I was 17. No way. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. In prison. Yeah. Like, well, it was, it was yeah, a juvenile juvie. detention the first time. Second time I was, uh, I stole a car. I, I essentially had, uh, anyways, I did a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously I wasn't an adult, so I'm good, but, um, I'm just not proud of it, man. Yeah, I yeah. just, I just feel bad for the people. Obviously I hurt, but, um, I ended up stealing a car to try to get away and I had a handgun in, in a backpack sit next to me. And I, I made a commitment. If the cops stop me, I'm just going to pull the gun and let them take my life. Really? Yeah. And I got in this uh, routine, like exited to get gas routine roadblock. And when I pulled up, I just gunned it and tried to get away. I actually made some pretty good distance for a second and ended up in this neighborhood and I came around the corner. I saw an open garage door. And when I, I thought I could like get in close, you know, obviously yeah, I've yeah. watched too many car chase movies sure. and, um, I smashed into the side of the house and I went for the gun Damn. and it got stuck as I was pulling on it. Really? So it didn't happen. It didn't. Yeah, man. And, um, I woke up sober the next morning in this jail cell in this small town in the middle of nowhere. And dude, I didn't know. I, I thought, I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't know what I was looking at three, four, five years. I'm 16. I'd already been to jail prior. And um, I ended up getting sentenced to about a year and a half due to the severity of my crimes. I went to an adult prison um, called uh, St. John Regional. I grew up in the East Coast of Canada. And yeah, man, it was it was hell on earth. Yeah. What's, yeah. What is what is prison like for a what, 17 year old? 16 yeah. Year old? I mean, I'm sure it's different for everybody. But the general thing is, is like. You know, like I said, I always knew I was a good person inside. I just made bad decisions. Yeah. So here I was trying to like stay out of stuff, stick to myself and like not get involved in the, the prison politics. But man, it's, it's just part of the culture. Mm -hmm. So it's like if, if you do something somebody doesn't like and they call you a goof, you got to say something. Yeah. You don't want to be relegated to, to um, you know, what they call a PC person, protective custody, where you're always getting picked on or whatever. And like I was a bigger kid, but it don't matter. There's gangs, right? Sure. And uh, one day we're having breakfast and this guy, Kirk, I don't know, like, you know, when you're in high school, there was like these guys that didn't work out, but just had an eight pack. Yeah. yeah. That was this kid. This, I was like, how are yeah. you so friggin' muscly? <laughs> you're, yeah, you're like 15. <laughs> and, um, and he goes for the coffee and I just finished pouring it all out. And he just goes, who drank the rest of the coffee? And I said, I did. And he goes, and he called me an effing goof. Mm. And then fight goes off cop the the all the guards come in grab both of us and literally like our feet, we're not walking down the hallway we're like floating down the hallway and they throw us in uh solitary confinement and it's probably the worst thing you can ever do to another human i mean you're in there in your underwear 
23 and a half hours a day, lights on, no mattress until nighttime, concrete block staring at a stainless steel toilet and sink wondering like how, and they don't tell you how long you're going to be there. Jeez. And, um, yeah, what do you do to keep yourself busy? Do you remember back then? Like, what were you like? Try to do push-ups, sit-ups, yeah. air squats, like work out. But how many, how many times yeah. are you going to work out a day? Um, think, think about life. Think about, you know, what, what am I going to do different next time I get out? Um, you know, strategize when I get out of here. How am I going to, how am I going to respond? What's the narrative? Um, you know, and just, I don't know, man, it was like super depressive. I think that's why a lot of people that go to the hole try to take their lives. Cause it's yeah. like, you know, they don't, that's why they put you in your underwear. Cause like if you, uh, they gave you anything, you would probably hang yourself. Right. Yeah. And on the third day I had this, uh, guard, Brian, that, um, he had, he wasn't working the day the fight happened. And, and Brian, you know, like these older men in your life sometimes that are like, you know, quiet, but everybody respects them because, you know, they've been there for a while they shoot they're straight shooters and um i respected brian like there a lot of the other guards i didn't have a lot of respect for you know they're kind of ding dongs but brian i looked up to in, in kind of a weird way and um he opened the door and he was just shaking his head and he said come with me and we were walking back to the cell block and we got close to the door that goes into the unit and we walked past it now in prison there's like walking paths and you do, there's like you don't go it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not like free range right <laughs> And I'd never been past the door. And the next door is the guard unit. And he walks me into that room and there's nobody else in there. I've never been in there. We're not supposed to be in there. Yeah. And he sits me in the corner and he pulls up a chair in front of me and like my back's facing the two. It's like the corner unit that looks out into two cell blocks. Ours is on one side and the other. And he just sits down kind of like this, man. And he, and he looks at me in the eyes and he says, what are you doing here, Dan? And I was like, well, you know, I got in a fight with Kirk and, you know, they threw us in the hole and he's like, no, nah, not that man. What are you doing in this place? And I was like, well, I got in a high speed chase and stolen cars and guns. And he's like, I don't get it. I've seen hundreds of kids like you, man. And I see you try to stay out of the trouble and just the way you are, dude, like you don't belong here. And I don't know what it was, man. Maybe it's cause he's, he like who he was and that he was saying this to me like it i broke down man mm. i didn't think that was the first time in my life that i had somebody believe in me way like i mean way more than i ever believed in myself and it like i don't know man i just was like well if brian believes this maybe there's something there and what do i got to do like what does he see and how do i change because like clearly i'm making bad decisions and like it's after that conversation, we went back. I like kind of got myself together and we went back and into the, it was kind of lockup time. So he put me back in my cell and I just decided no matter what happens, I'm not doing this again. And three months later, I worked my butt off. I started working towards my GED. I stayed in myself and I got released to a rehab center and uh, this place called Portage. And dude, normal people go there, average program, three to four months. I did 11. Wow. I had a lot of stuff to work on. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of stuff to work on. And um, this place helped me rebuild the relationship with my family, understand my emotions. You know, I was just, I would overreact, man. I was like, like take little things and turn them into stuff that it's like, why are you overreacting? And, and it was just a special place. All the staff there were ex-drug addicts. Do so you want to talk about mentorship? Yeah. Like I learned at 17, the value of getting around people that had been there before. Prior to that, man, when I was sitting there with a psychologist, a therapist, a rehab person, I'm like judging them so hard. Sure. Like you don't know my situation. They don't, yeah. I just couldn't even deal with it. I remember many times we were doing like family therapy and I would freak out at the therapist and I'm like, you have no idea. Like, tell me about your, sh like, tell me what, and, and they were like, this isn't about me. This is about you. I go, I can't even talk to you. And like, I go to this place. I, I, I almost left a couple times. I mean, they built it in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. so far in the middle of the woods that if you run away and many kids did that, like everybody lived on that street. It was like a hundred miles away from the main highway. <laughs> <laughs> the people knew you were a kid yeah. from Portage. Yeah. Like they didn't pick you up. You had to walk. Most of the kids started and turned around. And uh, luckily this place existed because it saved my life. Wow, man. And um, it was at the end of that program. I was helping Rick, the maintenance guy. It was built in an old church camp 
and um, we were cleaning out one of the cabins that we never used. And there was this room and inside was an old computer and a yellow book right next to it on it said Java programming. It was like a Ziff Davis book, if I remember correctly. And uh, I just opened it up thinking like, you know, computer programming, you think it's ones and zeros or freaking hieroglyphics like yeah. it's, and it's but it read like english it literally if you look at javascript or whatever it's like if this then that you know case and i was just like boot the computer up and follow chapter one of this book and it took me about 20 minutes but i got the computer to say hello world <laughs> and i literally it was like you're old enough to get this i thought maybe i was the doogie hauser of <laughs> computer programming right like <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe all the stuff I went through is because my brain's wired differently. Mm. Do you think it was? Do you think it is? It's got, I mean, I, th I think what I've learned since then is we can develop anything. Yeah. Um, but I think I wasn't, no. So I know I wasn't a great programmer. Later on in life, <laughs> I met those 10X programmers yeah. and their beautiful minds. I'm not one of them, but it didn't matter because I believed it. Yeah. So I became obsessed. It became my new addiction. I like got out and I told my dad about it. And uh, I was thinking of doing two things in career, either botany, maybe you can figure out why. Prior to that, I yeah. may have been into gardening yeah. and, uh, or computers. And my dad, very sage advice. He says, you, could, you should have a garden as a hobby and really lean into this computer stuff. Mm -hmm. This is 97. So I get out and get introduced to this like, little thing at the time called the internet. Mm -hmm. At the, the most perfect time. Yeah. And that's, that's been my journey. So like, I'm here because people like Brian and all the staff at Portage and, you know, I believe my creator showed up when I needed him. Mm. And the thing I'm most proud of is that I still go back every year. I'm literally going next week. Oh really? Dude, I go back when I was living closer. I'd go back three times a year, every cohort, I tell my story, sit down and talk to them and my commitment always to just those kids. And I can't, I can't extend this externally because there's enough of them over the last 25 years since that's happened where I'm working with a lot of people. But I tell them, get out, stay sober. One year, circle back. And when you do, tell me what your dreams are. Yeah. And I will put everything, and I've got some resources yeah. behind it to help them. And it is some of the most, I think it's why I'm here, man. That's beautiful, man. Hey. Yeah. All the other stuff, man, the business stuff, it's cool. Yeah. I don't think that's why I'm here. Wow. That's amazing. Do you have any advice for parents that are maybe listening to this who they see their kids going down that path? Yeah. Like, what do they do when they see their kid in the wrong crowd, you know, gardening, uh, just what gardening. Do they do? <laughs> gardening. <laughs> gardening. And, uh, yeah, what do they do? I mean, how do you, how do you stop the just it's pack It's so move? tough, dude. Like, because I'm public now, and, and what's crazy is I didn't ever share my story for 15 years. Mm. So imagine I'm going through the world, building software companies, exiting, yeah. investing, speaking, raising millions of dollars, and nobody knew that story, yeah. not even my fiance at the time. I share that because as soon as I got public about it, all of a sudden I'm getting these calls, the parents. Yeah. And I would always take it. I remember so many, I remember one time I was at the gas pump and my friend literally called me and says, my neighbor's kid is in trouble. They're beside themselves. He just got arrested again. Can you, can you take the call? And I was like, absolutely. And I get on the call with the mom and I could tell right off the bat that the, the challenge and no, no parent wants to hear this, but the problem is not sometimes the kid, it's the yeah, parent. Yes. Yeah. And I was like asking her about the situation. She's like, you know, he's been arrested twice. And now he's telling me if I don't pick him up and bail him out, he's going to kill himself. And, and I go, did he say that last time? And she's like, yeah. And I go, did you go bail him out? Of course. Don't. When I went to prison the first time, my dad, and I have two boys today. He said to me, and I can't even imagine how, how hard that was for him to say this. But he said to me when he came to visit me the first time. He goes, if you ever go back when you get out, I can't do this. Mm. I won't be able to visit you. It's too hard on me. So it's not missed on me how much a parent wants to help their kids. But I know for me, I kind of needed him to say that to understand how serious it was and, and in his way, show me how much he cared. 
and true to his word the second time dude six months i was there he didn't come visit me once wow but the day i got released to go to portage he was in the courtroom he it was just him nobody else came it was just my dad he want he he had a he knew there was a high chance i was going to get put on remand and, and to go there in close custody and I remember the drive, man. It was like, it's one of those moments I'll never forget. So when the parents call me to talk about this stuff, I'm like, I'm going to share stuff that I know in your heart. You're just probably not going to have the courage to do, but I'm going to have to, I'm going to tell you it. And I remember telling the ma, I was like, let him hit his rock bottom. Yeah. Cause here's the deal. If you don't, you're just enabling him and he may accidentally do something when he's high or drunk that's gonna take his life and you let it happen. There's a less probability if he goes to prison that something bad's gonna happen versus him accidentally drunk or high doing something that's gonna cause him to go away for 30 years or take his own life. So like sometimes as parents, by the time that stuff starts happening, it's a little too far too late. And, and all I can say is, and, and if you go to Al-Anon, you go to AA, or you go to any treatment facility, they'll say like, stop being a codependent, stop enabling yeah. this, set your boundaries. There's a reason why they do interventions. And that's actually how it works. But as a parent, I, yeah. it's what the do you hard, do? It's the hardest thing. Yeah, I've had family members go through it. And it's, it's like, what do you do? Because yeah, the, the same, the threats of, I'm gonna kill myself if that doesn't happen. And like, Can you imagine yeah. that you don't and that happens? Uh -huh. Yeah the guilt they might feel yep but i mean you just got to believe like man there's certain things you can control and other ones you can't and as yeah. long as you do it with the right intentions especially if it's supported by professionals yeah. like i'm the kid that was in the jail cell and i'm telling you if i was there and i could like fast forward to the person i am today i'm telling you what i wish somebody would do yeah. even though i'm not going to like it at that time your kid is gonna hate you yep. he may not talk to you for a little bit but trust me if you set the boundaries and then this is the kicker go become the person he would listen to most parents say to me my kids don't listen to me the guy said yesterday at the event we were, we were both speaking at he, he literally said this to me and i looked at him and i i grabbed his soft freaking jelly arms <laughs> man and i go dude you don't listen to you like let's be honest i looked in his heart and i was like dude i don't know why but god wants me to tell you this you don't listen to you and you're upset because your kids aren't listening to you mm work on you man go go be the lighthouse like go you can't show up and say to your kids go for your dreams and it's you old you know da 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 and then they watch you chill out drink on weekends get you know what i mean like yeah. it's it's there's a disconnect and i think i think your kids your family they feel it so it's like i just know that when i got sober because this is where i got this from right like i go to i go to rehab for seven or at 17 for 11 months i get out Look, my, my other two brothers had issues. My sister had, like, we grew up in a family of dysfunction. Yeah. And the easy thing, what most people do once they kind of have any success, you know this, you have one real estate flip and then it's like, you want to tell the world yeah. about it. Everybody should do real estate. Come yeah. around everybody, I'll show you how to do it. What I encourage people to do is just be the lighthouse. Be the example. You know, like the lighthouse does the same job as the tugboat. There's a ship out in the, in the ocean. It's coming into the, the harbor. It's navigating close to land and you want to keep it safe. Yeah. The lighthouse can help thousands of ships and it doesn't take any effort. It's just an example of where the boundaries are by being there. Yep. Whereas the tugboat, which most people, they're like, Hey, you should do this or you know, you should stop doing that. Now, now that I'm sober, you should, you should, you know, do you really need to hang out with Johnny? Like, is he really a good influence for you? You know, I used to hang out with this person. I, and I, it's like, don't be that person. Yeah. And then the cool part is that if you just go on that journey of betterment and personal development, and that's what I think like entrepreneurship is the ultimate personal development program with unlimited compensation, um, mm. is that when they're ready, you'll be ready for them. Mm. When they are ready, you'll be ready for them. Dude, when my brother came to me and he said, I'm done and I want to start a company and I've watched what you've been doing for the last five, six years, I wrote him a check for $143,000. Wow. It was all the money I had in my bank account. The reason is because when I was 16 and I was on the run, 
he called me, said, don't come home. The police are waiting for you. Mm-hmm. He says, I need to meet up with you. I want to give you something. And he gave me the last $63 and 10 cents he had. He was young. He's two years younger than me. Wow. Dude, he's now a multi deca millionaire. He runs the largest home building company, builds multi units. Really? He's got like, yeah, dude, he's got like 600 units. Like he's, he's in a, me and him. Like my other little brother is like a badass. <laughs> My sister's awesome. Like, <laughs> if you meet our family today, you you would not see the family that you think you would see knowing where we came from. Mm. And I'm telling you that happened because I showed up as, as just, I'm just going to work on me. I'm going to go be better. And when they're ready, I will be here. Too many people get, let's say, fit. And then they want everybody to eat better. They all, everybody work out. It's like, hey, why don't you just wait till they come in? Yeah. Right. Yep. Cause when they're ready, man, you can be helpful. Yeah. But if you're still on your early in your journey, you don't have much resource. So like yeah. when my mom wanted to get sober, no problem, mom, where do you want to go? Yeah. That's where do you want to go? I'll fly you there. I'll be there for you. We'll support you. There's parameters. Here's what needs to be true. If you do this, we will show up. Yep. Dude. It's like, I know parents want the quick fix, but sometimes it's not that easy. I read a quote online yesterday that said, don't be the man you want to be, be the man you want your son to be. And I thought that was a cool, like, oh, idea. so good. Isn't that good? It's like, be like, yeah. yeah. So good. Yeah. Who do I want my, like, I have a little, I have a three-year-old son, Wilder. And I'm like, what kind of man do I want him to be? Like, what's, what's my dreams for him? I'm like, how can I be that man? So, so check this out, right? Cause the other quote I've heard that's in that same vein is become the person you needed most in your darkest times. Oh, yeah. But isn't that what we want for our kids? Yeah. Dude. It's good stuff, man. Yeah. Become the person you needed most in your darkest times the person you would have listened to. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's why I tell you, man, I, I love the business stuff. I'm really, really good at it. Yeah. It's not why I'm here. Yeah. Dude, that's so good. And, and I'm a, I'm a big believer uh, in this idea. I think, I think the first guy I ever heard say it was uh, Gary Keller from Keller Williams agency uh, wrote the one thing, but he said something along the lines of you, the purpose of financial freedom is to get your bills covered so you can actually do what you were meant to do on this earth. Totally. And I love that idea of like, you know, once you have, a million dollars or $5 million, $10 million. Not a lot changes between a million and 10 and a hundred and a billion. Uh, and I'm not saying people shouldn't build wealth. I mean, I'm still building wealth, but entrepreneurship, just this idea of knowing how to build a business, lead a team, you know, be a leader, uh, have a vision that stuff can apply to so much more than just building a business. So it's like, I'm always encouraging entrepreneurs now. It's like, okay, y- good. You're good at this stuff. Now go make it, go make it matter. Like, how do we make that matter? Uh, hence the whole better life tribe that I'm doing is like, I still make, I'll make a billion dollars from real estate. Great. But how do I, you know, help other people in the meantime? Yeah. And so, um, uh, that's beautiful, man. Uh, so what came next? I mean, you started coding, you started doing some Java. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, <laughs> it's like, this is where the Rocky scene of like the montage yeah, kicks yeah. <laughs> in. Um, I call it success theater. I hate doing it, mm-hmm. but I mean, there was a lot of struggling. Like it, I started at 17 and I would just like build stuff. And like the first thing I ever built was like, uh, back in the day when you download, I mean, we're, it's, I'm aging myself, but you know, I'm 43 <laughs> and we would download MP3s and yep. then I had a CD burner. I was yeah, the only, yeah. 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 Dude, I so love, like, I my, love that era. My fr- I know. So my <laughs> friends so would good. like come to my house and put the playlist together yep. to burn their CDs. Yeah. So the first thing I ever built that I ever charged somebody for was this app that they would install on their computer. I built it in visual basic 3.0 early, early software stuff. And it would just F it would connect to my computer and download the, the, the drive of files that I had gotten off Napster yep. so that they could build the playlist on their computer. Cause the problem was is when they came to my house, they're sitting on my computer. Yep. Well, get, I want to be on my computer, yeah. right? Like <laughs> it's annoying. So the, all these, all my friends would just build this playlist and then it would send the, the order to my computer. And at night I would just like hit start and the CD ROM software would just like take the, the order and burn CDs and I charge 20 bucks a CD. Mm. So that was like technically the first thing I ever, <laughs> charge for that I built. What was on your playlist back then? Oh man. So, (laughs) so some funny shit. Um, (laughs) Andre Bocelli. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. I think it's Kunte Paltita, that song, Andre Bocelli. I don't know why I just love, there was just, I would code and I would listen to that song. (laughs) Um, but I would also listen to like, um, like I'm a big Lincoln park fan, Jay Z fan. But like, I used to listen to punk. I grew up skateboarding. Mm. Right. So, uh, lag wagon, Pennywise, um, no effects. Um, but yeah, I got into rap Eminem, dude, Eminem. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Eminem. Yeah. Like pfft, 
yeah r- like is now that i think about like how you know we just hit like a radio on spotify and it just like finds new yep. music for us no i would like burn out cd yeah. like cd like it's like the cd doesn't play yes. anymore because it just spun <laughs> too many times and on these like epic road trips so yeah i would just i just plug in and it was funny because like every night my dad made this deal with me when i got out he said if you uh if you finish the book there's an unlimited budget for me to for to buy you books so i'm self-taught programmer mm. and i would go to the local bookstore with my dad and I would go, I would just like, and that smell of bookstores is yeah. like near to my heart, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And I would just it. like evaluate, yep. like, do I want to learn about networking? Do I want to learn about database design? Do I want to learn about this new, like front end programming, like whatever it was. And then I would sit there and the way I would read the book, it's kind of janky. Again, we were, we were just, my dad, he, he moved, but we lived in a small apartment. I love him. Like he, he knew I needed to change location. I had to change yeah. high schools and, uh, we had a, and he like took his life savings essentially and bought me a computer and uh, a used computer that we built together a tower and uh, there was a printer and i would open the book and the way i kept the book open was this big ass knife like a rambo (laughs) knife and i would it would like it's just so funny because like i think i have pictures of it where i would just sit there change a page put the knife back and i would just code and i would i I would go like two three in the morning i became obsessed i didn't want to do anything else so like it just started by building other stuff for people, building apps, building a site to hold it. This early days of digital cameras. So like I was the guy building web pages for all the, you know, these like like half a megapixel friggin' yeah. photos. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I did two failed companies. I did a uh, maritime vacation, which was a vacation rental site. Okay. Yeah, my dad came to me one day and said, I need a, uh, I need a web page for our cottage, right? Cause like back in the day, yeah. you just get calls answering yep. the same questions, yep. right? Especially at cottage, it was like a vacation rental. Is it available? Do you accept dogs? How close is it to the beach? How many, you know? Yeah. So I said, oh, I could build a web page, but to host it, it's gonna be like $800. And he's like, why do you need a $800 for hosting? I, heard, I thought it was like 20 bucks a month. I said, dad, it's a very special kind of server we need. I, I said it was 800 because I wanted to build an app Mm. instead of just a page, I could have built that for free on GeoCities. I wanted to build an app. So he indirectly seed funded my little new business. And it was, yeah, it was a vacation rental site, no different than VRBO or Maritime Vacation or um, Airbnb. Not as sophisticated, obviously. But the first like real money I ever made, and this is like kind of the first company that eventually incorporated, I... I'm a software guy, so I didn't even know how to get customers. And my buddy Dave is a bit of a burnout. And we were talking because he, he'd been watching me build this thing. And I kept showing him and he's like, I was like, where, how do I get more customers? I got my dad, yep. my uncle's got a cottage, get him on board. But like, where do I find these people? And he's like, he's like, yo, dude, I think there's like a magazine, the tourism people have for all the bed and breakfasts. And I was like, where? And he's like, down at the tourism, like the, you come into the province or state and it's like that. So I went and I grabbed this magazine and, and sure enough, the back of it is all the bed and breakfast, all the cottages. So I just did this, like what people call direct mail, but I didn't know. I just had my little brother enter in all the addresses into an access database yep. and then mail merge with Microsoft. Yep. And then we just sent mail and it was this stupid letter saying we're maritime vacation. If you're looking for a web page, you know, fill out this attached form and send back $30 and three photos and, and oh, we'll funny. Yeah, dude. And then, so my dad came <laughs> home one day from work and he gets the mail and there's a stack of envelopes mm. addressed to maritime vacation. And he just looks at me, he goes, what did you do? <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, dad. And we go up to the apartment and we go to, in the kitchen and we open up the first one and there's cash. And he's like, Daniel, he calls me Dan- Daniel. I'm French. He goes, Daniel, <laughs> what did you do? And I was like, all right, here's what happened. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, man, it failed because I didn't, I didn't dream big enough, man. I call it maritimevacation.ca. We had, you know, maybe 300 clients. The guy at, at the cottage.com clearly had a bigger vision for what it could be. And did I, it, yeah. Did it fail or did you give up? I gave up. Okay. I, I gave up because it was just customers started leaving for at the cottage. Sure. Right. So like, and, and yeah, and I had other stuff. I say failure. And that's a fascinating question because a lot of times I think we say it's failure, yeah, yeah. but it's just, we chose to go do another yes, thing, yeah. right? In software world, we call it a pivot. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> They're yeah. like, I pivoted. I yeah. was like, no, no that's a crash and burn <laughs> yeah. and new start. Yes. A pivot is one foot firmly planted yes. in the idea and you move around <laughs> it to try to find, you know, product market fit. So yeah, that was, but that was like, you know, not dreaming big enough. That was my lesson there. Then I did a hosting company because if you build stuff that has hosting, you're like, ooh, yeah host with me lesson I learned with that company after I like spent hundreds of hours in a server room, literally installing software. 
uh, well, my brother, he was a sales guy cause he was more like externally, he was more extroverted to me back then. And, um, we, uh, we got a, a credit union as a customer and I was working on the site on the weekend and it went down like banking sites. Yeah. They shouldn't go down. And it was like a big win. And then quickly turned into almost like a major lawsuit. And my brother's like, I'm not doing this. Like, this is too risky. Like we each put in 5k lines of credit. Like, so I was 21 when we started that. I mean, it's kind of, kind of nuts. So then I, I learned the big thing there I learned was don't sell a commodity. Mm. We were selling hosting, man. Back, yeah. And this is before Amazon web services, like hosting back then it was literally 15 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. Like you're not competing. So, um, I kind of like, W walked around kind of deflated for years. Like, so started maritime vacation probably when I was 18 to 19 and a half. Then I did NB host 21 to like 22 and a half. And then it wasn't until I was 24 that I finally gave it another shot. I hired a business coach, man. I read the book, The E Myth. Oh, dude, yeah. That's dude, it was the first book I ever, it was the first book I ever read, but it was like the second or third. My buddy Corey told me about it. And I didn't even read it because my ADHD, I listened to it while I was driving. Yeah. I've burnt a lot, a lot, a lot of fuel yeah. <laughs> educating myself because that's the only way for a long time I could consume books mm. is in the car driving, no, no direction really. And I hired this guy, Bob, paid him 1500 bucks a month, US. I'm Canadian, man. That's real money, yeah. <laughs> real money. Didn't even have a business idea. Like I kind of did, but I didn't have a business. And dude, Bob showed me the stuff I was completely blind to about building companies. And we did almost a million in our first month or first year. Dude, I want to I want to know about this business, but before I do, we're gonna throw in this week's ad sponsor. But before I get to that, on the show, every guest gets to pick the charity or mission or cause that we direct all the ad revenue from this episode towards. So, where are we giving the money to? Globally, probably Boys and Girls Club. Boys and Girls Club. Yeah, hundred percent. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There's a uh, there's a big fundraiser come up in Maui for the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, I have a friend that's deeply involved. So. Yeah, we'll tell yeah, him. Thank you on things. my behalf. Yeah, yeah I that's love it. Cool. All right, man. We'll do that. With that said, let's. Roll the ad. Hey, sorry to interrupt this amazing podcast, if I do say so myself, to bring you an ad. And you know what? You might be tempted to skip through this ad to get back to the conversation, and I wouldn't blame you. It is that good. But then you would miss out on the free gift I'm going to give you. So hold on a sec. I wrote an ebook that I never officially published. It's called How the Rich Legally Pay No Taxes. And it's basically a walkthrough of how depreciation works for real estate investors and for people who uh, are not real estate investors and how you can use the same strategies that I do to pay really nothing in federal income tax. This stuff can even work as a passive investor into syndications. Many of my nearly 2,000 investors at Open Door Capital are actually offsetting some of their income with these strategies. So get the guide today. You'll read it in under 30 minutes, and it could help you save millions over your lifetime. Get it at odcfund.com forward slash tax book. All right. So a million your first year in that business. What is that? 840,000. Okay. Almost yeah. a million. Yeah. I'll take <laughs> I would it. say I have a billion in real estate. I'm like, no, I have like 800, <laughs> 900 million, whatever. It's close enough. Yeah. We round up. Yeah. We'll, we'll round up. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. What was that business? That was uh, portal software. So back in the day, companies inside the, their, their, their corporate intranet, they would have like the homepage. Yeah. So for a while it was static. And then eventually there's this thing called like dynamic web pages where like every person that logged in, it would have a unique mm. experience, right? It would be like their dashboard. That was, that was called enterprise portal. So today it's SharePoint and many other technologies, but I was early to that. I built some software around it. We were selling to fortune 1000 companies. So we had, we, I, and that is crazy on its own. Like how did a 24 year old yeah. get Procter and Gamble, Dole Foods, Johnson and Johnson, Pfizer, oh, like, yeah. yeah, a lot of East coast pharma companies out of New Jersey, a lot of CPG brands out of, you know, Toronto and, and others. And, um, that was, that's where I learned business. You know, I started reading good to great. Yep. I was like, all right, I need my BHAG, need my, yep. you know, I need my flywheel. I need to figure all this stuff mm -hmm. out. And, um, I, I started to like move away from just coding. I still, I still wrote code for freak, probably two and a half, three years out of the four year journey. Wow. Yeah. Like I, but it was like three hours cause I loved it. Like yeah. there's something, you know, it's like if you're in a construction, like building yeah. it at the end of the day, you look back and you're like, I could see what I did. Yeah. You know, sometimes in business you wake up and you work really hard and you pass out at 8 PM and you're yeah. like, I didn't feel like I did yeah. anything today. <laughs> I became so, a millionaire at 30 and I was still changing toilets and dude, and, and it's like roofing houses. And yeah. Yeah. So that, that journey and, and Bob really, you know, showed me how to think about scale. And, and during that man, like 
mistake after mistake after mistake, workaholic, right? Working hundred hours a week. My best friend, Nick still jokes. He's like, do you remember that time you came to my birthday party and you brought your laptop? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, why? He goes, dude, you were like the worst friend to be in like buddies mm -hmm. with. Like I sat there in his living room. There's a full party going on. I'm yeah. talking like a massive house party. <laughs> and this guy's sitting there in the corner doing fucking emails and yeah. contracts. Like mm -hmm. it was, but I was just so nervous of, you know, that was my edge. Yeah. Right. And then what if I stop that, 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 that hustle and the whole thing falls apart yet again, yeah. I'm on my third company. My dad, like he said to me once he, he, he begged and like, I grew up and did some really stupid stuff. And when I started my third company, he was pretty much saying like, this could be the stupidest thing you've ever done. And I was just like, really dad like this this, this is, is the a, thing you're gonna say is the stupidest thing I've ever done there's a whole laundry list of stuff and he was he literally would say to me like I think you should just go get a normal job mm -hmm. and I go dad I'm so unemployable like I'll probably get arrested because I was so opinionated man yeah. I had I was so like I just I would I just thought everybody was dumb like that was just where I was at at that point and um yeah two years into that journey you know, we grew really fast. And as you know, the, the, the sound of growth is cash flying out your business. Yeah. It truly is. People are like, whoa, congrats. You've grown so fast. It's like, I have no money. Yeah. Right. Unless you figure out what I've figured out now with this like positive cash conversion cycles, most companies require a lot of capital to scale. And here it was, I think it was, yeah. Year two, December, I just hired six new people. The team was pretty big at that point, almost 30. And I wasn't paying attention to my financials and Christmas happened. So like December 15th, everybody goes off. The whole team's gone vacation mode, come back January 4th kind of thing. And I'm looking at the forecast and I realize I'm not going to be able to make payroll. Ooh. Yeah. That's a sickening. Feeling. And there had been other moments where it got close. Yeah. I mean, earlier on six months in, I had to, to sell my receivables to a factoring company. Yeah. Like, so I was like double stupid for, for not looking at the financials and hiring too many people and, and realizing, all right, man, like I'm going to, I'm going to have to lay people off, you know, or shut the business down. And I went into a bit of a depression. The reason why is because my birthday is December 26. Mm. So like everybody on their birthday always kind of does an inventory. Like what have I done with my life for the last 12 months? Yep. Right. Well, what, and then what do we do on January 1st? Same thing. Yep. What have I done with my life for the last year? Right. So here I am going, I screwed up again and I'm going to fail the third time. Maybe my dad was right. Maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not a good mentee. Maybe, maybe I wasn't listening to Bob the way I should have been. And it got so bad that I would like at night for three nights in a row, I would just fill the bathtub up and lay and I'm a big guy. I get it. People are going to have some visuals, but I would just lay in the bathtub yep. with my nose above water for a couple hours mm. until the water got cold. Don't know why I did that. It was therapeutic in ways. And I remember on the third night, I was just like, okay, you can either, you can either let this happen or you, you can decide to do something. Yep. And for whatever reason, I asked myself, who would care if my company failed? And you know, I was thinking like, who would care? Obviously my employees, but how are they going to help me? They don't know. You know what I mean? And then it occurred to me, the government would care because I created a bunch of jobs. Our revenue is us based. We're a Canadian company. They love that stuff, right? Cause we're bringing export dollars into our country. And, um, so I, out of the blue cold emailed essentially the governor of our province, mm -hmm. like, cause all the public officials emails. And I just told them this short story. My name is Dan. I run this company. Here's our revenue year one, year two. I'm trying to figure out, you know, how I continue to grow. I'm running some issues. Is there anybody else like me around? I just didn't have anybody. I didn't have a mentor in yeah. software and technology. Like I didn't know, I didn't know another person that ever made any money in business. Right. And he replies, man, at one in the morning, this guy's name is Frank McKenna. And uh, I've, I've shooken his hand since then. He gave me three people's names. Jerry Pond, Steve Palmer, and uh, Ken Nickerson. And I mean, <laughs> Jerry Pond, if you Google him, and I love Jerry, 
Jer Jerry at the time was maybe 72. Now he's like 80s. He's like a lot older. And he looked like a grumpy old man. I love Jerry, <laughs> but dude, I was, I was like, I'm not going to message this guy. He's going to rip my head off. Yeah. Kindest human in the world. Mm. I emailed him the next day, replied right away, invited me. It was a two hour distance, invited me to meet with his team sat down for an hour, turned it into three hours. He was blown away. He's like, how did you do this? I'm 26 years old. I built this multi-million dollar company. He's like, you gotta, you gotta tell my, my, my VPs, like, what did you do? Cause I, I just, I built the company the way I would build software and I outsource everything. So our core team were only engineers building code. Mm -hmm. Our financing was, was done 12 hours away. Our BD or biz dev and sales was done in the U S like, I literally just didn't want anybody that like, Again, I was opinionated about smart people, so I just wanted smart people around. I mean, Ken Nickerson to this day, one of the major reasons I moved to Silicon Valley to build my other two venture back companies is because he gave me that advice and encouraged me to go. Like that one email from Frank McKenna changed my life forever. And that's when I really understood the power of mentorship, being yeah. around people that have done it before because they compress decades into days, man. Yep. They truly do. And I, I don't think people understand how and sometimes it's not, as you know, it's not even what they say. Yeah. It's how they are. Yeah. It's watching them operate. When I went to Jerry's office to see his multi, I think he had like four or 500 employees yeah. and watch how, how much fun he had with his business partners. Yep. He's like, Bob, check this out. And they're like, we're in the boardroom and I'm like sitting there nervous. I'm wearing a tie suit. Like, you know, they're like in whatever polo shirts and <laughs> stuff. And I just, I think like that, that was incredible to learn at that age. And, and luckily we saved the company. We quickly fixed the way we did pricing and yeah. cash flow. And um, four years later, we sold the company. I became a multimillionaire. I mean, it's, it's just, dude, it's crazy. Dude, I love that. You know, last summer uh, we, you know, I buy real estate, right? Like large multifamily and-, and I figured that by the 850 million. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So we buy a lot of apartments and uh, we got six, we had, we had like a dry spell, like six months and couldn't get anything, maybe four months. And then all of a sudden we landed six huge apartment complexes in like one week. It was completely nuts. This is like, uh, yeah, interest rates are, you know, starting to go up and it was a crazy time, but we got like all these apartments and we're like, oh man, we got to raise $120 million in like eight weeks. Uh, and I, you know, I raised 20 before and 30 before at, you know, different times, but this was more than I'd ever raised in three years of business. I had to do it all in one time. So we're like trying to figure this out and we're struggling and we're, we're getting there and it's slowly ticking, ticking up there. And I, I start to realize I'm not going to be able to do this. Like I'm going to lose millions in earnest money, you know, like the deposit. Yeah. Cause I'm not gonna be able to raise this. And I'm gonna look like an idiot to my investors. I mean, they're good deals are really good deals. Just everyone's afraid. And I'm up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And, uh, I, and there's another gentleman up there. His name is Ken McElroy. He wrote the book ABCs of real estate investing. He's good friends with Robert Kiyosaki and, uh, he's probably like, I mean, he's the godfather of real estate syndication. What I do. I mean, he is the goat. I mean, he's the guy and he's there all month. Just like I am. We hung out on a boat a couple of times. And so I'm complaining to another friend of mine. I'm like, yeah, I'm you know, really struggling. This is hard. And he goes, well, what would Ken say? And I was like, I haven't well, asked. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, like, I'm not going to ask Ken. I'm like, he's like, he's right there. Go, you were on a boat with him. Go ask him. He's, I'm like, and then when I looked internally, why I didn't ask him? It wasn't because I didn't think of it necessarily. It's because I didn't want to admit that I didn't know what I was doing good enough. Like I don't want to admit I wasn't good enough to a, a men, like a guy that's a you mentor, look up right? To, yeah. I look up to. Uh, so I anyway, he challenged me about it. My buddy challenged me. Uh, shout out to Elliot Smith for pushing me on that. And I took Ken out, and like I would, I'd pay a million dollars for that hour long conversation today. Beautiful. Like I mean, it changed my life. We we revamped everything we do in our. And like you said, it wasn't just what he said. It was that he made the impossible look like a Tuesday morning. Just yeah. like oh yeah, no, just do this and this and this, and you'll be fine. And it was like, and it was, it just, I can't, yeah, overemphasize that. Dude, what idea. I think he did, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but this is what my mentors have done for me and just people in general is he show he extended his power of belief. Yes. Yeah. In the simplicity mm -hmm. that made you go like, yeah. I'm just going to believe him. Yeah. And I think that's the coolest part about this journey we're on is like, we get to do that for any other person at any point. Yes, and it could yeah. be subtle, man. Like I'm, I try to be super intentional because of people that showed up in my life, mentors, Brian, you know, in prison to like, if I see a dad in line, like my wife's like, can you stop? I'm like, no, I gotta go tell him. Like mm -hmm. I, we were at, we were going through passport control recently and I was just so impressed with like this dad responding to his kid freaking out. And I just kind of whispered in his ear. I was like, man, you're a good dad. Oh, that's cool. 
Yeah. I just listen to my heart, man. If I see it, I think we just should tell people. Mm -hmm. It's like, because people always want to go, did you ever go back and tell Brian? Here's what's bananas about this, okay? As you can imagine, it ain't easy to find a prison guard. Yeah. Okay, so like people are like, did you talk to him? I go, I tried and it turns out they don't allow, it. it's like sure. almost like, uh, they're like, Brian who? Yep. Like, we don't know a Brian. I'm like, he works there. Yeah. We don't have, you know what I mean? Like yep. it's just, I think it's just the way they do it, which makes sense for safety reasons. But eventually I had a woman that I, uh, she was a counselor at Portage I finally met and she knew exactly who I was talking to. And I said, could you at least just ask him? And we met. And dude, like he kind of remembers the conversation, <laughs> which, you know, I asked him, I said, Brian, what? He goes, dude, I would do that to a lot of the kids. Mm. Yeah. That was, that was who he was. Yeah. He goes, I, I remember you. I don't remember that specific thing Yeah. because like a lot of kids, you see these. And I just think it's such a powerful um, thing we have inside of us to just like lean into. Yeah to just tell your friends. Like sometimes we just, we're just too busy. We don't want to say anything. We don't want to make it weird, but I'm telling you, man, like tell somebody if they're a great server, just how incredible they are. Tell, tell, you know, send a message back to the, the kitchen. If you're at a restaurant, and you had an epic meal and tell the chef, you know, like I just think that power of belief in other people, what your mentor did for you, that is what it's about. Yeah. Right. We're, and we all have it. So we get to extend it yeah. to our prox the proximity of people. Yep. You know, I, uh, do you know Bob Goff or know Bob Goff? He's an author. Yes. He wrote the wealth book. Uh, yes. Maybe? Maybe. No, no. Bob Goff, the, uh, yeah. he writes about yeah, religion. Lo yeah. Religion. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a the book called love. love does. I think. Yeah. Love does. I awesome. Book. Speak. I saw him speak recently. I mean, probably the best speaker I've ever heard. Like period. I mean, I've never seen him speak. He's so now I'm, I'm unbelievably okay. entertaining. Like yeah. just the, his style is unlike anything I've ever seen. Yeah. His but, writing is yeah, amazing. Writing's amazing. But he, he, I mean, he sold millions of books, millions and millions and millions of books. He puts his phone number, his actual cell phone number at the end of every single book. He puts his email out there publicly uh, and he answers his phone every time somebody calls. As long as he's not in the middle of something. He answers his phone all day long. He's just driving around, you know, traveling, just answers the phone. Hey, it's Bob. And like anybody can call me. He's like, test me on it. Call me anytime. And he says this to this group and uh, several people in the room are like, yeah, I've called him. Like I, I talked to him and he answers every single email, every single one that wow. he gets. And he was talking about this. And he said, because people are the purpose, like people are the purpose of all of this. Like, what are we doing if it's not people? And I realized in that moment that I saw people as the obstacle to my purpose. Like all people, like, oh, another DM, another email, another text. That, you know, somebody call. You know, I do all the time, phone rings. And I'm like, oh, like my instant reaction is like, oh, they are an interruption in my purpose. Uh, but that, yeah, Bob, just that one thing changed my life. In Dude, that that's a big unlock, man. Yeah, it's people the, are the purpose. Yeah, it's, the, it's not part of the process yeah. to get the outcome yeah. it actually is the outcome yeah that is the outcome the outcome wow. is people because at the end of the that's day that's good, all we man. have is relationships that's so. really good yeah if you get a chance to like, i'm gonna call him bob yeah call him dude, dude i have his book him. so yeah. i put my email in my book i didn't put my cell number yeah the cell number is that's like a that's a gangster level. move yeah and i still don't like answer everyone my dms but I, i'm dude i don't answer phone calls yeah. i don't <laughs> recognize so good for you bob hey yeah i don't think i get on board with that but like i think it's awesome yeah, I don't know how he does either. We're going to get him on the podcast, and I'm going to ask him that Well, question. dude, similar to that, do you know who Marshall Goldsmith is? He wrote a book, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Yes. So, dude, I'm so silly. I sell my company for a couple million bucks, you know, like not even 10, but it, it, it yeah. like changed my life. Sure. I'm 28. I moved to San Francisco, and I think, all right, I worked with Bob. I need a new coach. Yeah. I read this book, and I email Marshall. And it's, I don't know how I got past his, his assistant or whatever, <laughs> but she schedules this call. And we get on a call and I remember talking to him about like his coaching and how it works. And he's just kind of, he's not smug, but I could tell he was smiling. And he goes, well, well Dan, I, I just want to let you know, cause I asked him about like his fees. He goes, the way I work is I, I typically only work with like CEOs of fortune 50 companies mm -hmm. and we'll work together and I'll do a 360 interview with their clients. And at the end of the year, they kind of look back on the work we did together and then they write me a check. Wow. And that check is in the neighborhood of, you know, seven figures. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, Mar I'm so sorry, Marshall. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not, at, I'm not there. Yeah. Right. Uh, I let me, cause I didn't even have a business, right? I just sold my company. I'm yeah. like still trying to figure out what I'm doing in my life. So I was like, didn't want to waste his time, but, uh, true to his character, he, he does a hike, uh, like he walks every day. 
and he allows anybody that wants to go visit him down in San, uh, yeah, Santa Rancho Fe or whatever down in San Diego. What is it called? Rancho Santa Fe? Rancho Santa Fe. Sure. Is that a place? All <laughs> I right. Don't know. Americans, please correct me. Um, but uh, I, so he invited me to that, but he said, Hey, are you free next week? I'm doing an event in LA. And I was like, I will be there. What he, and he invited me as a personal guest. Mm. And I went there because he does that every Tuesday for the last, because I moved to a new mountain town. We do a hike every Tuesday morning. It's open to anybody. That's a cool idea because of Marshall. Yeah. And he doesn't even know I do this. I got to tell him because like he, he indirectly by saying kind of like, I'm probably not a fit, but again, to who he is as a person has helped me connect with hundreds of people that have flown in from all over, like from Florida yeah. to uh, Netherlands to do a 45 minute hike. Yeah. That's Dude, so it's good. like the, it's like one of my favorite things that happens every week because of again, how people show up yeah. through their example. Dude, I might start doing that on Maui. Dude, I'm telling you, yeah. like, I really think it's, I call them founder hikes. Yeah. And it's a cool way you're out of town and you meet somebody cool and they got a restaurant, they yeah. got an HVAC company. You're like, dude, just come on this hike. We do yeah. it in the mornings, get it before you're, you know, the, the world wakes up and, and we just have these epic conversations. Yeah. Alex, let's do the, let's do the hike, Alex. Founder yeah. hikes. That's a yes. great idea. Yes. Can we do a founder uh, walk along the beach in Maui? That yeah. Better. I sometimes <laughs> turn them into walks if, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's cool, man. Oh, okay. So you obviously built more businesses yeah. and you made a lot more money uh, and you teach people how to do that. I want to get into some non-business stuff for a minute. Uh, you married, yeah. right? Uh, you, you mentioned earlier, you said you were engaged to somebody and then it didn't work out. Uh, can we talk about that for a second? Like, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what's that story? Um, it was when I was building my company sphere. So I was 27, you know, and like I said, like almost failed had another, you know, like had to sell my receivables, tried to hustle or kept hustling, then almost went, you know, couldn't make payroll, kept hustling. And at the same time, like kind of a year into building that company, I got into a relationship with this, this woman. And, you know, I was traveling so much. I was traveling like 200 days a year, right? Like all of our customers were the biggest of the biggest companies. Mm -hmm. So a lot of HQs, visiting, meeting with the tech teams, all that stuff. And you know, eventually like, I was like, she's the one, she was a social worker. She got me, she was beautiful. She was kind. She was like all these things you would want great relationship with her parents, all that stuff. So, uh, we were on vacation in Bermuda and I proposed and we were engaged and the wedding was like July of this year. It was like, you know, I'm 27 and I was working like a madman. Like it was just normal for me, like wake up, go to the office work. Right. And it was like a Sunday uh, uh, morning and I'm at the office and she's like, you gotta be home by five. We're going to go to my parents' house for dinner. And I'm like, no problem. And I didn't pay attention to time. And it's like six 30. So I'm like rushing home. We just bought this house. And when I walk in, I see her in tears and she's in the kitchen and she's like really beside herself, you know, kind of, <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes people have an ugly cry, you know, where it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but she literally could not talk. And I was like, worried somebody had passed yeah. away. And she literally just goes, I can't do this anymore. And she takes the ring off, leaves it on the counter and walks out. Wow. Yeah. She went to her parents' house and that was the last day we were together. Wow. Seven weeks before the wedding. What did you learn from that? I learned that the people that you love, that you say that you're doing it for never asked you for any of it. Oof. Oof. I want that to sink in. I hope everybody gets that. One of my friends said that to me once he had, he had three young kids and uh, he heard me share that story and he broke down he goes, I remember telling my wife five years ago when the business was in a tough spot. Um, I need you to take care of the house because I'm going to be gone before the kids wake up and I'm not going to be back until they're in bed. Mm. And for the next year, and he admitted it turned into two years, he didn't see his kids. Yeah. And I'm like, they never asked you for any of that. And if you ask yourself, why do you have to work like that? It's because you're not willing to go look in the mirror and figure out how are you showing up? Yeah. You, the world economy is there. Yeah. You don't have to work like that. I wrote a book specifically to help yeah. people not build companies they grow to hate. Yeah. So it was really like self-inflicted. And that's, that was the lesson I learned is like, and I was worried, man, cause I was so driven, didn't want to lose my edge. 
that I thought maybe I was just going to have to like relegate myself to being the rich uncle. Yeah. Right. That fun uncle that yep. brings presents and all the, my nieces and nephews love, but I can't have kids. I shouldn't be in a relationship. I'm, I'm a piece of crap. Yeah. And luckily I found mentors and people that showed me a completely different way to build companies. And then once I understood how to get leverage, and that's what I talk about in my book is, okay, well then how do I, how does, how does a great relationship work? Yep. And this is all I did. I took the fundamentals of success in business, the rhythms, the routines, the values, the conversations, yep. all that, and applied it to my, my, my home life. Yes. And some people yes. are like, that sounds really like clinical. Yeah. And I go, it works. Yeah. So like me and my wife have a weekly meeting every Wednesday we have lunch. Yep. Okay. Now we have lunch other days, but on Wednesday it's a, there's an agenda. And the first question is I ask her how, well, we share wins, right? Cause we always like, sometimes people are busy and we're doing so much cool stuff. Like my wife sometimes sees stuff on Instagram first. So we have a rule oh, now. It happens all I, the time. I not a lot. Yeah. Anytime I have a big win, I have to call her and tell her first. She's mm -hmm. just like, and that, and those are and that, came, that right now. Yeah. That came from conversations. The other one I'll give everybody is don't answer the phone unless you have time to talk. Mm -hmm. My dad told me that answering the phone saying, I'm really busy. What is it? Yeah. Don't be that guy. Just don't answer. My dad's like, I don't have anything important to do. I'm retired. I just wanted to talk. So if you can't talk, why'd you answer your phone? Cause I want you to know you're important to me. He goes, you're showing the opposite by answering, telling me I'm too busy to talk to you. Speed it up. And I was like, obvious. So yeah, we have the weekly meeting, seven different points on the agenda. We do quarterly reset retreats where we disconnect, we plan, we review our goals, our annual one in December. Yep. We review our goals, we update our vision boards. Yep. We talk about our challenges, who do we need to become? What, how do we wanna show up as parents? We do an annual uh, seminar of sorts for our relationship, for our marriage. We did Date With Destiny last year. We, yep. Dude, we have a parent coach. We have a coach that literally audits how we interact with our kids. Mm. He's taught us how to be emotional coaches for our kids. Mm. The most beautiful thing he taught me, that everybody should write this down. No correction without connection. Mm -hmm. I am not allowed to correct my kid until I slow down and ask them, how you feeling, buddy? Oh no. You know what I mean? Like yeah, really so connect, good. like be there. And then from there, let them know, hey, I just want you to know, like you're responsible for your own emo like emotional yeah. health. And I can't tell you, I'm not, I can't force you to do anything. I'm just here to help. So you need to tell me how I can help you. Well, my brother did this. That sounds tough, man. Yeah. Like. So like we have coaches, we have a family coach that we, that flew in to live with us, to watch us. Really? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Wow. She's amazing. Brooks, her name. And, um, she, it was just like, because that's what you do in business. You hire yeah, a coach. Yeah, exactly. come in. Like, yep. dude, I literally just took all the things that worked really yes. well in business and just applied it to our relationship. And it's how we've been able to evolve as a couple. Dude, we're going to be best friends. You're, you're speaking I my love language. It. I love this it. It's great. Man. Uh, I want to, I want to throw back to one thing, a, a quote that I read online, another quote I read online. It said in 20 years, the only people that will remember you worked late are your kids. And that hit me so hard. So I'm like, good. like, like you're, no one's going to remember. No one's going to care, uh, except your kids are going to remember. Uh, and I, I try to remember that. In fact, just this, just this morning, um, I was supposed to do a podcast. I got asked to do a podcast on Friday. I was supposed to go home on Friday. Yeah. Uh, today is Thursday. So I'm supposed to go home tomorrow. And I was going to got invited on a big podcast tomorrow, but it's afternoon. My flight was at noon. So I called my wife this morning. I'm like, Hey, uh, just FYI, uh, I got to stay until Saturday now instead of Friday, uh, just one more day. Uh, cause I got this huge opportunity to be on this cool podcast and uh, you know, it's going to be really good. And her eye, like she didn't say anything. She'd go, okay. But I just saw her eyes just like drop a little. And I was like, can you let Rosie know? Who's my seven year old. So like, can you let Rosie know? Uh, I was like, I was like, I, I said, did you let, does Rosie know I'm coming, was coming home tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. If you just don't say anything, she won't know until Saturday. Yeah. And she goes, no, she's been counting down the days since you oh, left. Oh no. And I was like, shoot. I was like, well, just try to break it to her lightly. And then I went on and then an, I don't know, a half hour went by, hour went by, I'm sitting there drinking my coffee before this interview. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? Like, what, what am I doing? And so, yeah, I just told Stetson, I'm like, we got to. We got to postpone that thing. Like what? It'll, it'll be there later. Yeah, 20 years from now, no one's going to remember that I was on that podcast that one day when I'm going to be back in Vegas in Dude, two we'll months. We'll sell ourselves on stuff like yeah. that all the time. Yep. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, wild, man. But yeah, just that idea, though, to go back to using the same business principles and plan it to your personal life. That's changed me as well. I mean, I literally track, did I have a date night or a date you know, with my wife twice? Like, with my wife, I have, do I, did I get 10 minutes of connection time? I got the little kids. So they're, they're always with us Yeah. and we homeschool. So like 
So I have to attract, did I get 10 minutes of no kid connection time? Yeah. So like just the wife talking and eight times out of 10, I don't get that. Uh, but I track it. So at yeah. least I know that I'm not getting it. And so then yeah. I'm asking questions like, well, why aren't I getting it? And what can I do better? And I have an accountability like group, just like we do in business, but they, they know my habits and they know my actions that I'm tracking. And so now I'm getting better at them. Yeah. And everything in my life has gotten better since I started tracking the we, metrics. The we inputs. manage what we measure. We, yeah, exactly what it is. And uh, yeah, anyway, that's the whole. The, yeah, Dude, the, la the last, last yeah. and you're going to love this, man. Yeah. But the last chat, it's a bonus chapter. And I almost didn't put it in, but my writing partner, Paul, told me to add it and it's literally seven pillars but the way i i do it it's literally what you're saying so yeah. health wealth relationships spirituality friends and I, I track myself every friday i've been doing it for almost a decade yeah and it's just a spreadsheet and my rule is whatever two items in this list of seven gets the lowest score i just commit to one action item to bring the score up for the next week mm. because that way and this is why i tell people that are struggling in their uh, relationship is the the marriage that people that get divorced is because they have a fracture yep. and it gets too wide. Yeah. So because I sit down with my wife every week and one of the questions we ask each other is how have I shown up as a husband for you? Yep. And all my, I, all we're allowed to say as a response is thank you. There's no argument. There's no negotiation. There's no explaining. That's thank so you. I have the feedback. And as long as I'm not, you know, dead to the world, like you're going to want to do something with it. So I have a shot to make it better. And I think like, if you call that clinical or too structured, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like where else is he, where else are you getting feedback? Well, I just know she's happy. <laughs> Ask her. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful, man. Hey, where did you, uh, where'd you meet your wife? I met her on Twitter. She hit me up on Twitter. Really? Yeah. Since I'm here, I get to tell my version of the story. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, she hit me up on Twitter now. In her defense, she was doing her job. She was in PR and I was speaking mm. at an event. She was, she reached out to interview me to pick my brains. Yep. And then I like looked at her profile. I was like, <laughs> you could pick more than yeah, that. Yeah. I'm like, you're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, luckily I became the person who knew how to talk to women by then. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it, it was after, I think I was like 20, I would have been 29 when we met and, um, living in San Francisco. And yeah, within three or four months, she decided to move in and yeah, we kind of both knew what we wanted and our, our two boys are 11 months apart. So they're Irish twins. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so t right now they're the same age. They're yep. both 10. My sister and I are the same way. Yeah, That's cool. Twins, yeah. yeah. Dude. Uh, what's her name? Renee. Renee. What do you love about Renee? Oh man. So much. The thing I love about her, she's a little insecure about is just how goofy she is. Mm. She's so beautiful. She's like a girl next door kindness like i think runway model beautiful that doesn't realize it mm. and and like she'll like dance around the house or be silly and i just think it's the coolest thing in the world and when i say that to her i love i love oh you're so goofy or i like crack a joke she doesn't like that <laughs> so um but yeah that's what i love about her man that's she's, amazing yeah she's just such a down-to-earth person and how are, how are your kids 10 10 yeah right. well what do you love about each of them um, Max loves to measure and tell me about specifics. It's fascinating. Mm. His brain is like, you know, he, he's always running numbers and calculating stuff in his head. And, you know, kind of fun fact, the reason I named them Max is there's actually like, um, science and like, uh, I don't know how much science, I mean, there's, there's gotta be around birth orders. Mm -hmm. So the oldest are usually quieter, right? Are yep. you the second oldest? I'm second oldest. Yeah. yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the funny. second oldest are usually the black sheep. Yep. So, so because of that, I wanted my oldest to have a powerful name, mm. Max. Yep. Second, being a black sheep, a softer name, Noah. Mm. And so people don't realize it, but I like very intentionally gave them those names to like help counter, uh, counteract the, the default behavior, right? So what I love about Noah is just, how friggin cuddly and smiley is man he's like he can't sit next to renee or i without having his hand on us like with my wife sits like she'll we'll be out at a restaurant and like in four seconds noah somehow finagled his way into her lap yep. and he's 10. i'm like yep. dude just l leave your mom give her some <laughs> space right but that's that's what i love about him it's just he's he's very tactile and yep. it's just he's such a cuddler Oh, amazing. And that's Max. What's the other one? No, that's Noah. Oh, sorry. That's yeah, Noah. Max likes numbers. Noah that, likes yeah. to cuddle. Dude, that's so good.
Yeah, I'm a big believer in kids live up to their names in a lot of ways. And I, I don't know if that's because we treat them the way well, that we name them. It's labels, or, dude. Yeah. I grew up being told I was, you know, almost Dennis the Menace, man. Mm. Like Dan, Danny. People call me like Danny. Danny's like, you know, the bad kid or whatever. And it's just <laughs> like, yeah, I think we live yeah, into we the labels. Yeah, we labels, yeah. Yeah, so I'm very careful about the words I use to describe my kids. You yeah. know, early Max was good at numbers. And they were like, oh, you're so much better than your brother. I was like, you're essentially saying Noah doesn't know how to do numbers. Yeah. Like, be careful. Like, I, I then intentionally stop praising that default kind of characteristics and start telling Noah, like, dude, yeah. you're just as good as your brother. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my, uh, my daughter's Rosie, and she's like the prim, proper girl. Loves she's the, the tea oldest? Parties. She's the oldest. Yeah. yeah. Loves the tea parties. Loves the, the stuff. She's just like, she's all girl, and Rosie just fits, right? And then my son uh, is named Wilder. And he is just uh, wild, wild. He's just a nut. <laughs> you gave and him the it. name. I gave him the name and wow. I wanted and it. And he's the second oldest. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, wow. He's going to be, he's a oh, force. And I love dude, it. He's going to teach you so much about yeah. everything. Yeah. You know, there's a, uh, there's a book called uh, wild at heart by John Eldridge. Yeah. I know that book. Okay, yeah. yeah. Wild at heart. There's a, there's a story in wild at heart where he's hiking or rock climbing with his kids and his kids young, I don't know, five, six, seven. And his son is struggling. He's at the top and he's looking down at his kid and his kid's really struggling to get up this, this, uh, hill. And John yells to his kid, come on, you can do it. You're a wild man. And he's like, the kid just like chest rises and he just scales the mountain. And uh, I love that story and that label that you get. He gave the kid, he gave him an identity. Like you're a wild man. And so actually I never call Wilder Wilder. He's only wild man. That's, oh, since cool. he was born, it's like, hey, that's a good wild nickname. man. Yeah. And I'm like, I want him to just be that. Yeah. That's the identity. Like identities come from labels oftentimes. And so, yeah, yeah picking that and, and you choosing our words. That's uh words that's matter, man. man. Turns out words matter. All right, man. Well, let's talk about the book a little bit. Buy back your time. What does that, what does that mean? What does that phrase mean to you? Yeah, to me, it's, it's helping people avoid, as I mentioned earlier, building a company they grow to hate. Yeah. I think too often people think like I need to sacrifice, I need to invest, I need, and, and it's not that you don't have to work hard. It's just, you need to figure out like building a business is all about you know, like a business doesn't exist unless there's people. Yeah. So as soon as you bring people in, you're essentially saying, I'm going to trade money for time. Yep. But nobody ever teaches you how to do this. So the buyback principle, which is a first principle. Okay. I'm a, I'm a physics computer guy. It's a math principle too. I teach about the buyback formula states this. You don't hire people to grow your business. You only hire people to buy back your time. Mm. If you buy back your time, you will grow your business. If you just hire people to grow your business, you won't buy back your time necessarily. So I call it a calendar over capacity problem. Too often people want to hire folks to increase their capacity, but they inherently should just not be doing things that suck their energy yep. or cost very little to pay somebody else to do so that they can free up their capacity yep. to go do the thing that they love to do that makes the business the most money. It's actually, once you see it, like, and I teach the buyback loop, people it's like they get it they're like oh wow i'm not i've been doing it ass backwards yeah. and it's like i know i used to be that guy my fiance left me i had to look in the mirror and go what beliefs did i have that weren't serving me and how do i change the way and and then for me because i'm a little bit more left brain than than right i i, I need the i need the math like show me logically how i was flawed so i systematically i wrote down 25 of my best friends names entrepreneurs like podcasters artists um, HVAC owners, lawn care, like literally the small businesses of, you know, America. And I wrote the book and I would just work through every objection they ever told me about everything I'd ever shared with them. And that's why a lot of people, when they read the book, it's like, it's like, you're looking at my soul. And I'm yeah. like, I'm hoping to, because I've been teaching this stuff for 15 years and I've always, I see where the, I got the, the pushback. What so are some tactical things in there? I mean, we like VA, obviously hiring a VA, yeah. hiring an assistant, like is that what but we're talking more, about? Yeah, yeah. So so let's so on that though, it's the buyback loop is three parts. First part is a time and energy audit. Okay. We want to look at our calendar and assess. So I, I every client I work with, if I do private coaching, which is rare, but you know, high end folks that are super capable, they run into this as well. Okay. But even if you're like no employees and it's just you yep. and you're like I don't know how to build this company because if I grow, I'm going to, I call it the pain line. I'm just going to have more pain. Mm. No entrepreneur is going to grow into pain. Yeah. It's impossible. So what I get them to do is a two week time and energy audit. Every 15 minute timer goes off. They got to write down what they did. Mm. Yep. So once they've got the audit, right? Most people are like two weeks. I'm like, yeah, two weeks. Like you're doing stuff on Saturday. We've got to look at it. Right. Yep. And then we highlight in red things that take their energy in green things that give them energy. 
And then we put a dollar sign next to it that's like one dollar sign if it's low cost, four dollar signs if it's high cost. Yep. And then we take all the red stuff and the one dollar or two dollar sign stuff, put it into a bucket, and I go, that is the only other hire you can make right now. Mm. You want to go hire another guy to cut lawns? Nope. Look at look at the work that you go cut lawns. Yeah, yeah. And then have somebody else do all this stuff. That's brilliant. So so yes. Uh, an EA at the, so there's five levels of hiring. So I call it the replacement ladder. There's, I literally broke down the process of like how to hire good. Cause most people are shitty hires, how to lead better. Cause most people have, you know, people don't quit companies, they quit bosses. Yep. So most entrepreneurs just don't know how to communicate anything to anybody. So, yeah. you know, and then they just don't trust, right. And they have all these beliefs around like, what if they make a mistake, blah, 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 blah. So I really looked at the, the complete system to help people scale and essentially like, it's, it's bananas watching people implement this stuff. And like yesterday, a guy came up to me. He's like, I just got 35 hours back in my week. My wife is happy. I feel I got time to go to the gym. Yeah. Like, and then guess what? It applies. You want to talk about family? The last chapter is the buyback life. Mm. Dude, we have a house manager. She runs everything that's personal is run through her. My car registration, my real estate stuff, like all our personal assets. She's the CEO of our lives for my wife and I. It's so amazing. that we do one of two things. We either spend time with people we love, yep. including our obviously our kids, and or do and create cool stuff that only we can do that we love to do. And that's that's what I want from every person. And it's not a zero sum game. Like everybody can have this if they're willing to show up differently. Oh, so good. The book is Buy Back Your Time. I'm assuming you can get it everywhere. All over the place. Amazon, bookstores. Yeah, it's, it's you know, I published with Penguin. It's become a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Dude. And I'd love the support. Love it, man. Before we get out of here, I want to do one last little uh, segment here called the 321 Pivot. You mentioned pivoting earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, three books that have pivoted your life, that have changed the direction of your life a little bit. Two people and one quote. Cool. Three books would be... Um, the E-Myth, for sure. Uh, this awesome book, nobody's, not a lot of people, but it's called Love is a Killer App by Tim Sanders. Okay. That was the first, first book I ever read. Taught me to fall in love with reading. And then the third, I would say Think and Grow Rich. It's Perfect. the entrepreneurial Bible, for sure. Love it. Two people that have changed your life. I mean, oh, you kind of mentioned I've them mentioned already, a but. few, but I would say my wife mm. and my dad. All right. And one quote that has changed your life a little bit. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Quote. Jim Rohn or Albert Einstein. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so good. All right, man. The better life question. What have you done in the last year? That's improved your life. Dude. Getting a jet. Really? Yeah. What'd you buy? I got a little citation. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, it's one of those things that if time is money. Yeah. 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 You bought it, back some time. Yeah. And it turns out I'm stuck in Vegas because it, our, my pilot said he's never seen it so hot. So the engines, it's not safe to fly out oh, at no. noon. <laughs> so I got to fly out tomorrow morning at like three in the morning, which is just, it's awesome. Cause like you talk about opportunity and like yep. podcasts. So I get to go do some really cool podcasts t this afternoon that yeah. I didn't want to do. And, um, yeah, my pilot said, are you sure? Like I'm willing to take some risk. And he goes, uh, there are bold pilots. And there are old pilots, but they're not bold <laughs> and old pilots. I was like, enough said. That's so good, man. All right. Uh, last question. Where can people connect with you at? Instagram is my favorite. That's your Instagram, thing. Instagram. Yeah, it's just the, the messaging there is really easy for me. If anybody, especially if they read my book, I'm going to do something for your audience that I don't Please. do. Is if they, they want the, so everybody wants to know, like, how do you do the assistant stuff? Yeah. I have a complete like SOP, I'm a playbook guy. Mm. So if people literally want the Google doc, there's no opt-in, I'll just send them the link. If only if they're a uh, listener. So what should they send me? So I know they came from here. Oh, what word? word Brandon better or life. better life. Better send life. me a, send me a DM on, um, on Instagram or, you know what, actually let's do EA so that I know what you're asking for. Sure. EA executive assistant. And I'll send you the SOP, the standard oh, operating procedures. Yeah. I'll Dude, do that as a gift. I love it. Thank you very much. And your handle is just Dan Martell, two L's Martell. All right. Perfect then. Thank you. Appreciate, Dude, appreciate it. That was awesome.